morning. Please be seated for the Advent candle lighting. In this season of Advent, our sense of expectation is stoked by so many messages. Some build our expectation for material things like gifts or food. Some build our expectations for social things like family gatherings and Christmas sponsors.
Our readings today come from the first chapter of Luke's Gospel, reading first the uh, first four introductory verses of chapter one. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. <coughs> Continuing in the first chapter of Luke from verse 5, where we find the account of Zachariah being visited by the angel Gabriel. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abiah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of and when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Here ends the reading for today. Thanks be to God for his word. Through the season of Advent, and then the following season of Christmas, right up until Epiphany, there are a number of odd encounters that take place in the, in the story that stand out from the background of human activity in that they involve angels. And so through these seasons, we're going to each week focus on uh, one of these angel encounters. Before we look at this first one, I want to do a little bit of a backgrounder on angelology, um, just so you know a little bit about what that is. Uh, before the Enlightenment, 
humans didn't really uh, understand the concepts of the, uh, the scientific method and uh, research for the purposes of, uh, of discovering new things. Uh, they took as authority the things of scripture and the things that were told to them by people in power. There wasn't a lot of uh, second guessing going on. And part of the process of understanding more about these things was study. People did a lot of research, study, uh, exploration of various concepts and ideas. And one of the key areas of exploration was things about uh, what God was doing. And that was called theology. The study of what God is doing. And then there are a number of kind of compartments of theology where you're looking at some of the aspects of how God operates in the world. Uh, one of these is the study of how Christ works in the world, and that's called Christology. And then, of course, there's another branch of theology called angelology, which is examining how angels function, and what they do, and where they come from, and what there is about them. And there was, for centuries, a lot of research done about angels, not just in Christianity, but in Judaism, in Islam, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, there was a lot of study from the world's major religions around angels. Who are they? What are they? Where do they come from? Where do they go? Some of the debates got ridiculous. There's a record of one debate that happened uh, uh, in the Middle Ages that they were uh, trying to figure out how large angels actually were and there was a uh, debate about how many angels could dance on so it got ridiculous. Because they didn't have any new information. The information that they had came from scriptural accounts and from personal experiences. And even today, you can go to certain places in the world where people will uh, attest to them having angel encounters and it changed their worldview their understanding and indeed their person, the, themselves, they were, they were altered somehow by these encounters. There's more since the Christ event, the birth, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, maybe about Mary and her visitation to people than there are about angels, but they're very similar. The way people talk about angel visitations and the way they talk about visitations of the Blessed Virgin. Through these seasons, we're going to look at some of the angel encounters that are central to the unfolding of the, the Christmas story, the, uh, the so-called infancy narrative. How did they happen? What were they like? what did they mean? But I think maybe a little bit further on that, what they mean to us today. And so we look at our first angel encounter. Luke starts off the narrative about Jesus with an angel encounter that really didn't have anything to do directly with Jesus, but with John the Baptist's parents. That that was the beginning of the involvement some months before. And the angel came and visited Mary. Now, when we see angels in our modern uh, mindset, they all look kind of like this one. They all look pretty. They all look female. They all look... Um, radiant somehow, and lots of material. 
If you were to encounter a being that looked like that in a place where you expect it to be by yourself, I don't know what your reaction would be, but it probably wouldn't be a reaction such as Zechariah had when he had his angel encounter. In the scriptures, the angels are never depicted as female. They're either depicted as being male and powerful, or kind of androgynous. That they're neither male nor female, they're sort of something different. But in every case, they are the bringers of a word of change. And they're not always received very well. Zechariah is typical. He doubts the word that he's given. He wants independent verification. He wants uh, science, some scientific investigation into this. He wants to know, how can I trust you? How do I know what you're telling me is true? Because everything up to that point in Zachariah's life had said that hope is futile. Everything about the way in which life was supposed to work out, you couldn't trust. It was uh, just going to happen and you had to do what you were asked to do and when it was your turn, you did your part, but it was not a whole lot of uh, personal engagement in it. It just happened to be his turn. It says very, very carefully, it says in the scripture that he was doing it because his name came up in the lottery. He won, or maybe from his perspective, lost. He had to go into the temple, into the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, where he would be by himself doing the ritual incantations, burning the incense that was to take a pleasing order up to heaven so that God would look down upon Israel with good faith. And it says there in the scripture that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were upright. They did everything that they were supposed to do, but they did not have the one thing that they had hoped for and had counted on, and now they had given up. And that was children. Children were not good at work for them. And they'd given up. They were just going through the motions, waiting for the end on the porch swing, as it were. And there was really just going through the motions. Thinking it was just going to keep on, keep it on, the way it always kept on. He'd like to be told something different. He was sat, comfortable, knew what was expected. These kind of visitations come to us of change, and often we react the way Zechariah reacted. We, we doubt it, or if we don't doubt it, we just don't like it, we reject it, we will even at times fight against it. This past week in Oshawa has been a tough week. It has been a week where we've had a visitation, maybe not by angels. They wouldn't think of themselves as angels, I'm sure. But there has been a word that has come down that to Oshawa is an unpleasant. It is said that the way we've been doing things for a hundred years that we had kind of expected would continue on indefinitely is coming to an end. And the reactions, I know my reactions when I heard the news and uh, I was sad, I was angry, I was, uh, I was wanting to fight, I was wanting to cry, I was worried about 
the futures of my friends and neighbors in the community who had uh, anticipated that the motors had always been there, the motors would always be there, and they would provide. It came as kind of an odd visitation saying, well, you know, that's not going to be it. It's going to be something different. We're going to stop doing the way we've been doing. We're going to do something different. And we don't know what it is. We don't know if it's going to be here or it's going to be somewhere else. We always expect the worst, don't we? And Zechariah, I'm pretty sure he did, expect the worst, that it's going to happen somewhere else, not here, because the way things happen here has been told it's going to stop. Unless we can turn it back the way it was and make them continue on and not have the change happen. It's happening in the United Church of Canada. We had the writing on the wall. It's been coming for a long time. Just like it has with General Motors. It's been coming for a long time. We had the message about this a long time ago. The United Church of Canada cannot afford to continue the way it has been. The money's running out. The numbers are running out. We have to do things in a different way. And there's been a lot, and it still is, a lot of fallout within the leadership of the church. As we don't know what the future is going to be like. We're trying to figure it out. And we're trying to listen for angels. So what is an angel? An angel is a messenger of God. That's what angel means. It means an, a, a message of God. And they get different names in Scripture. And you'll hear the different names. Like there's Michael. You know, is one of them. And then Gabriel is another one. And each one of these names that we hear are names about a specific kind of message of God. So the messages come in embodied forms. I think that's the kind of the key thing about what the angels are. They come in embodied forms. They don't come as um, there, there's a, a, a term in a spiritual term called interior locution which means that the word comes inside of, you know, people will say that they heard a small voice head, um, something like that. They know it's not their word. They know that the word is coming from somewhere else. It's not theirs. Uh, but they know it's true. And that's, that's uh, an interior locution. Well, the angels are not interior locutions. They are manifestations outside of a person. They are something that they are being told by a presence. It's not something they're hallucinating. It's not something that they're wishing they were seeing. And it's something that they can't explain. They know what they've seen. They know what they've heard. And it has impact. The first angel visitation in the, in the New Testament to hear in Luke is um, is that kind of uh, presence who comes in an unexpected place, in an unexpected time, in an unexpected way, and brings a word of change. And the change is all laid out in A, B, C, D. It's all very carefully laid out. These are the things that your son is going to do. These are the effects that his word is going to have. And this is all coming to fulfill something that has been foretold. It is the plan. Zachariah, of course, notes it, just as any of 
cuts wood, and as a consequence, he is silenced. He's not allowed to express his doubt to anyone else. He's silenced until it comes to pass. Not a word. Not a word until you see that this is all coming to pass. And that's the hardest thing for us, isn't it? The hardest thing for us is that we think we know, but we can't say anything, and we don't know, and nobody's telling us anything, and it's a big fog as to what the future is going to bring. But in the midst of that, there's this first word of Advent. And the first word of Advent, the first part of the expectation that comes with it, is hope. Hope is a way of um, encountering the unknown. It's a way of looking towards it, even though you don't know, it is to have a positive aspect of your expectation. It's not going to be the end of everything. Well, even if it is, that needs to end so the new can come. The change that has to happen can come in order for it to do that. The old has to go away. It has to end. Zachariah's life needed to change. He couldn't stay going the way it was. He couldn't just go through the motions anymore. He couldn't just be trying to follow the rules and be just a good, upstanding person. He was going to be asked to do something that he was not prepared for, and he was going to do a good job. first angel is about that kind of hope. Now in the week since the announcement from General Waters, there have been all sorts of voices. I don't know if you've heard them on the news. Uh, pundits who've been giving their uh, feedback on it. And uh, they're saying, you know, this is, this is the thing that we hope for. At some point, the big three motor manufacturers in North America would get with the program and would understand that fossil fuels need to be left in the ground. And they need to come with a new way of providing transportation and energy. And the other side of the announcement last week is that's what General Motors finally is deciding they're going to do. They're going to disinvest from the old to invest in the new. By the time I have grandchildren, if I have grandchildren, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, they're all going to be driving around in Autonomous electric vehicles. Can you imagine that? Autonomous electric vehicles. You won't have 18 people killed by cars in Toronto every year anymore. You won't have the person texting on their phone crashing into the back of you in an on ramp. You won't have those things happen. That the promise, hope for the future, is embodied right in the very word of ending. Right in the word of collapse and destruction, there is the word of the new being born. Advent is not about preparing for death, is it? It's about preparing for birth. It's about preparing for the new thing coming. And so we are in that time. 
We are in the Advent time. Not just in Scripture, not just in our annual festivities, which are so glorious, but they are in our very workaday life this year. We're right in Advent in Oshawa, maybe more than anywhere else on the planet outside of a few other cities in the United States. We are right there knowing what Advent is. What has been is coming to a close. What is coming is just now starting to be the star lifting <coughs> the horizon. In Christ, we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those love him, dear, and esteem the office. The word is hope. Hope be with you, go before you, walk beside you, 